Now your report, what type of process did you use to develop this report? This can be a very tricky type of, of report to do because you have to get the cooperation of, of governments, you have yes. to get the cooperation of some of the rebel groups, you have to get a cooperation of a lot of different players, many who don't trust each other and who don't want to work together. So how did you develop this report? Well, you know, the UN system, especially in the armed conflict areas, is a very strong presence, mainly both humanitarian, political. And so basically what this uh, monitoring and reporting mechanism that the Security Council set up is that all the UN actors on the ground verify and collect information of what's going on. And then this is uh, then, then uh, done with uh, uh, independent NGOs and independent government institutions, if there are s there, would collect information, verify the information, and send it up uh, to the uh, to the to our office. And then we deal with all the UN agencies. We have a task force that looks at this information and verifies it. And then we go the extra mile. We every country that's listed, we sit with them and say, this is what the allegations are, and they have the opportunity to respond to that. And then we check again with the country teams and, and we stand by some and then the others, they may actually have a valid point or they may want their point of view reflected. We put that in. So in a way, because we are, it's a security council, it's a consultative process, and then we issue the report. It mm -hmm. comes in the name of the Secretary General, of course, here, and he, uh, he, his office is uh, very much a part of the process. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is a very important report. It's one that I think will be of great interest to people, even if they have not followed this issue. What are some of the recommendations or conclusions that you make in the report? Well, because it's a report to the Security Council, um, it's pretty much limited by that framework. It's not to the world in general. So one of the things we suggest is that at the moment, the only way what we call this list of shame uh, where actually the UN is naming and shaming, which it rarely does, so that's a big step forward. Mm -hmm. To get them to do it was an enormous task. But to make it not only for child soldiers, but also on groups that continue to use sexual violence. We're finding this phenomenon, especially in the DRC, the systematic use of sexual violence, like in Bosnia or the DRC. Those groups should also be in the list of shame. So that's one of the things we're asking for. Secondly, we're saying now over the course of five, five years, there are 16 persistent violators who have been on the list of shame for over five years. It's time to move. The Security Council must move now to a taking targeted measures and set up a mechanism to do that. There are some in the Security Council that are reluctant to ha give, do the measures and that, those kinds of sanctions. Um, but uh, I think we have to move toward uh, that. Uh, Mm -hmm. and also that we want to make sure that action plans are f facilitated by governments with NGO, uh, with uh, non-state actors and actors. So these are some very specific mm -hmm. things linked to the Security Council uh, process and deliberations that we are recommending. Mm -hmm. So now the ideal situation would be for the United Nations to take a hands-on approach to this, dealing with this problem, and also to develop a ban against child soldiers. Yeah. And the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has come out, I believe just recently, and indicated that he is certainly in favor of this and moving this process forward because, as you mentioned, it's very important to not just be aware of it, but to make sure that you try to defuse it and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Yes. Well, actually, there is a ban on child soldiers. The UN system has always been that. What he has said, and that it's coming from this report, is that we should move for toward targeted measures, you okay. know, to implement the ban. Um, and I think, you know, um, many people have different views of the UN. Should it, should it just be? Some people feel it should only be a place to talk, and that it shouldn't take these kinds of measures except, except in extreme circumstances such as sanctions and targeted measures. And within the UN also there is that debate. Should the UN be punitive? That's mm -hmm. the question. Um, and that debate is raging. Now, of course, all of us who are interested in issues of impunity and accountability feel very much that uh, punishing does deter people. Uh, and that the ICC, for example, having uh, done a case now against Thomas Lubanga, who is uh, on recruitment and use of child soldiers, this Security Council list of shame has resulted. When I go to the field, when I talk to these, like in Sudan, the signatories and the non-signatories, 
the first question is, you know, will the ICC, will we be there? Will, are we on the list of shame? How do we get out of it? These things work. And that's why it's important to have the political will to go ahead, and not to do it arbitrarily and in a, you know, in a in a in a unreasonable manner. But you know, six when you're five six years on the list of shame and you have the opportunity to get off it, then I think um, there's something that needs to be done. We have actually a case. All the parties in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, who approached the UN when they were put on the list of shame, said we are willing to uh, to. Uh, enter into action plans. Mm -hmm. The UN entered into action plans. They released all the sh uh, child soldiers. The situation verified, and this year they're off the list. Mm -hmm. So, so there has been some success. So there's certainly positive movement in that yes, direction. Yeah. Yes. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, and the main purpose of Global Connections Television is to focus attention upon international issues that impact people in other parts of the world, but also in the United States. We also look at the role of the United Nations in helping to overcome many of these problems. My guest today is talking about a major problem. It's a problem that's affecting 300,000, approximately 300,000 children in perhaps what we consider far-flung areas of the world, mostly in Africa, but also in Asia and Latin America. But it may be a problem that we, we have a much closer connection with than we think. Radhika Kumaraswamy is the Special Representative for the Children in Armed Conflict, and she was appointed to this position by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who is Secretary General of the United Nations. Ms. Kumaraswamy is a lawyer by training, and she has won many awards, such as the International Law Award of the American Bar Association and the Human Rights Award of the International Human Rights Law Group. Radhika, this is a very important topic. It is one that I think your, your committee has done, or your group has done exemplary work on. You mentioned this list of shame and how countries, some countries have moved off, some are, you're monitoring them. How can you, do you have sufficient staff to do this? Do you have enough people in place to, to monitor them and to stay in touch with them, to see if they're doing what they said they were going to do, and to see if they are actually uh, progressing, and at some point, hopefully, will graduate off of this list, list of shame and, and uh, be more, uh, shall we say, not involved in this, in this horrific use of child soldiers? Well, I think, as I said, in Cote d'Ivoire, some of the non-state actors entered into the action plans and were taken off the list. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the UN system has uh, UNICEF in the field. It has peacekeeping operations in the field. And in each of these organizations, there are people who are related to child protection. And they spend a lot of time. And these, I, what we do when I get publicity for, I cannot thank enough these people who are in the field, on the ground, who actually collect the information, who enter into tireless negotiations mm -hmm. with the non-state actors, trying to plead with them and tr get them over to try and enter into action plans and to demobilize. So it's really the f eyes and the ears of the UN, which are the humanitarian agencies and the peacekeeping operations that do the work on the ground. We process the information in mm -hmm. the center. I see. Now, you mentioned UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund and the peacekeeping operations that may be going on in a particular country. Do you bring in any other UN agencies? Are there any other th others that would come into it uh, to be of assistance in, in certain yes, projects? Yes, all of them. In fact, they, UNHCR, ILO, they're all High part Commission of Commission for Refugees. Uh, uh, yes, and, uh -huh. and the, the International the Labor Organization. International Labor right. Organization, the Human Rights, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So they all have, there's a country level task force that is entrusted with collecting the information and working on this issue. And all of them are members of that task force.